Hey guys, a uh, big welcome back to all my fellow comic fanatics and pop culture aficionados. Uh, can I even use that word, aficionados? Sounds pretty cool, so we'll go with that. Uh, as promised, uh, this video is going to focus uh, solely on uh, Charlton Comics. Uh, I've got a stack of stuff to show, but kind of I, I want to talk a little bit about the company, so if I start, this video is liable to be kind of long, so I'm, I might start to uh, ramble on just a bit, so just uh, bear with me and uh, have a little bit of patience. But, uh, you know, Charlton's one of those companies when I was a kid, I mean, you'd see the stuff on the newsstands, and, uh, you know, sometimes it would grab your eye, but if you saw a Batman or a Spider-Man comes on, hey, you know, I'd rather have this, but like if your favorite comics wasn't on sale a lot of times, you might pick up a Charlton or an Archie comic or a, or a Harvey comic or Atlas or whatever was out at the time, so, but, uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of uh, guys that started out, you know, younger, like when I did back in the day, uh, when you really got into reading comics and uh, you started getting into the characters from DC and Marvel, you, uh, you know, and I'll admit, I was a DC and Marvel snob. You know, I would pick up a few issues of the other companies now and then, but, you know, DC and Marvel was the main thing. But uh, that's one of the things about collecting. I mean, there's, there's just so much great stuff out there and stuff that you wouldn't really think would be all that great. Uh, but getting back to Charlton, uh, I've got some magazines and I've probably shown these before. I think there's been about eight of these published, uh, Charlton Spotlight. And it just has a lot of, uh, you know, cool interviews and uh, some unseen artwork. Uh, and just telling a lot of history about Charlton. Really, uh, they started out in Derby, Connecticut. and. The whole operation was under one roof. I mean, they uh, they had some of the artists work there. I mean, a lot of guys freelanced and they brought their stuff in or sent it in. But uh, you know, they pretty much had the whole operation in one plant. I mean, they did the art, the coloring, the lettering. The they pressed and printed the books, had the docks and the trucks, and they just loaded everything up. And uh, but back when they first started, Charlton pretty much published everything. I mean, they published pulp magazines. Uh, song books I mean anything that they could publish I mean they would publish and uh, you know they could do it cheaply because they uh, pretty much just used cheaper paper and materials than everybody else and they paid lower rates to the artists and the writers uh, and I think why a lot of guys worked there and where they could have got better rates was because they had so much freedom to do what they wanted to do as far as like story wise or art wise or, and uh, and, if, and if you're interested at all in Charlton Comics I mean I would I would highly recommend this magazine. Uh, I'm sure you can, uh, I'm not sure what the website is, but uh, yeah, it's charltonspotlight.com. I think they, they published eight issues of these, and the last issue I think they published was number eight. I still need to get through it for myself, but uh, I think the last issue published was like in 2013. Uh, but lots and lots of great articles about artists and, uh, and just how the company worked and all the inner workings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if uh, anybody remembers reading Charlton Comics, uh, they remember seeing this artist's name on a lot of stories. Now, I kept wondering, said, who the devil was Pam? You know, I probably talked about this before, but the guy's name was actually a Pete A. Morrissey. That's what Pam stood for. And he actually just did... Uh, did that as a part-time job because he was a cop and the reason he signed his name like that was because he didn't want to know that he was moonlighting on the side writing and drawing comic books. So uh, there's another one of his creations, Johnny Dynamite. Kind of drew like in a, I guess in a noir type style. The pretty cool stuff. And anybody that's read Charlton has, has seen his stuff because it's all over the place. Uh, Another guy, and I, I especially on this one, because this is a spotlight on Tom Sutton, one of my all-time favorite artists, and he did some great, great work for Charlton. Uh, here's a black and white repro of one of his covers from the Mini Ghosts of Dr. Graves. Just really, really cool stuff. And here's another one. It's got uh, a Nick, Nicola Cuddy interview. I mean, this guy wrote everything. I think he did some uh, work for DC and Warren and maybe Marvel too. Uh, you know, and we uh, we have to give Marvel or Mar not Marvel, but uh, Charlton credit uh, for the creation of E-Man. 
And the back of this, uh, anybody that collects the Doomsday Plus One title, this was actually the uh, unpublished 13th issue after John Byrne left. Uh, this was to be the 13th issue, and this was drawn uh, by Tom Sutton, and they've actually, for the first time, printed that story in color in this issue. For So anybody that's a fan of Doomsday Plus One, you know, another post-apocalyptic uh, type comic. And this last issue was uh, drawn on by Tom Sutton. So, like I say, a lot of the, the artists that worked their time, you know, they could have got better rates at Marvel and DC because they're getting like five, ten, fifteen dollars a page when they could have got twice that at the big two. And uh, a lot of the guys that were working their time, uh, you had Dick Giordano, you had Steve Skates, you had uh, Denny O'Neill, you had Jim Aparo, you had John Byrne, you had Tom Sutton, uh, you had Pat Boyette. I mean, these were guys that did a lot of great work for the big two later on for Warner Magazines and what have you. Uh, but the reason these guys that stayed at uh, Charlotte for so long is because they could pretty much do what they wanted to. You know, they could go ahead and write and draw a story and send it in and they would pay them for it and they would publish it. Or they would uh, get a note saying, okay, I need a cover for a ghost book, or I need a story for a ghost book. And they could just pretty much have free reign, uh, do anything they wanted to do. And uh, they'd have a lot of artistic freedom, which anybody that follows Steve Ditko work knows he uh, felt kind of constrained at Marvel and probably DC too. So, uh, but, you know, later on, like in the 70s, uh, Dick Giordano jumped ship, and he came to work for DC Comics. And, of course, you had guys follow him like, you know, Tom Sutton and Jim Aparo and, uh, you know, Byrne came to DC later, but he went on to Marvel, you know, and Pat Boyd came to DC and did a lot of horror stuff. Uh, so just a lot of great talent. Of course, Denny O'Neill, you know, everything he did with DC and Marvel. Uh, but just in a nutshell, that's like a little brief history, but I would highly recommend getting a Charlton Spotlight magazine for anyone that's interested or anybody that collects Charlton comics. Uh, it's kind of getting addictive for me, and I've seen a couple people in the comments when they knew I was going to do this video, or was going to do this video, that uh, said Charlton was kind of addicting, as yeah, you know, and uh, like, there's really no big great storylines like, you know, eight or ten or twelve issue arcs like DC and Marvel even had back in the early 70s, you know, late 60s. Uh, you know, there's no Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, you know, cosmic sagas, but uh, they're just fun little comics, and they, uh, and the company did a little bit of everything. Uh, so I'm just going to show you what i got in the stack here, kind of talk about it a little bit. Uh, first few are mainly odds and ends, but uh, guys, you can get this stuff dirt cheap. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, if you just want some good, cheap entertainment, I mean, you're missing the boat if you're not getting the Charlton stuff. It's just my personal opinion. Doesn't mean anything. But uh, get to the books. Beetle Bailey, number 67. Like I say, they did a little bit of everything. You know, this is just... Uh, for those times when you don't feel like getting into a, a multi-issue arc or story, you just sit down with uh, something mindless and just kind of pour through it. Uh, it's kind of cool to get this one. It's kind of low gray, but uh, Jetson's number one. It's got some pencil on the cover and it's a little chewed up at the top, but I thought it was kind of cool for a couple bucks. Okay, a lot of this older stuff, uh, it was kind of like Goki and, and uh, Dale. They didn't put the numbers on the cover, and half the time they didn't put the numbers on the interior. So I think a lot of this stuff, you know, I'll probably have to get on GCD and uh, find out what the issue numbers are. But uh, here's an issue of Fight Marines. Uh, no number, but it says October. Looks like from the early 60s. It's an issue of Attack. Looked inside, there is no number. It just says published quarterly. <laughs> So anybody that's into war comics, and these things are dirt cheap. Uh, something a little bit different. Uh, Black Fury. And that is a May issue. I don't know. Probably early 60s too. That's the thing about Charlton. They publish a little bit of everything. Uh, here's one that features the NFL. Uh, professional book football. 1969 superstars. I've actually got two or three copies of this. I don't know how I came about that, but it uh, seems like I'm always picking up a copy of this every so often. Okay, we have 
Fighting Navy. I think there's actually a number on this one. 123. And another issue of Fighting Navy. Uh, no number. This is the October issue. <laughs> Fighting Marines. Again, no number that I can see. 12 cent covers. Another issue of Fighting Marines. Pretty cool covers. It's really hard to find Charlton stuff in any kind of high grade because the, the paper they used was uh, like worse than newsprint. It was really cheap paper. Okay, uh, getting into the good stuff. Uh, you fans of the Phantom. This was actually the second Phantom issue that Charlton published. This is number 31. And uh, this is actually a Jim Aparo cover. One of my favorites. Great art in this one. And this is a, this is a run that's really uh, affordable. So for like from issue 31 on up, uh, there's a bunch of Jim Aparo art in this. Okay. Got a pretty high grade copy of this. It's Pat Boyette painted cover. Korg, 70,000 BC. It's number one. It's a Hanna Barbera character. And then we get into a little sci fi. Uh, Space War, number 29. A lot of great Steve Ditko art in these. I think a lot of these are reprints. I'm not sure how much is new art and how much is reprints, but, uh, you know, still. The Steve Ditko, you know. Number 29. Number 31. Another great Steve Ditko cover. And for some reason, I have two issues of this. Uh, number 30. Another great Ditko cover. There's the duplicate. And uh, a few fans of Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon number 18. Space Adventures number 8. Silver Age sci fi. And there's a Jim Aparo cover again. So that's really the first time I've ever seen a sci fi cover by Jim Aparo because everybody knows what he did for DC. I mean he did Batman and Detective, uh, Phantom Stranger, The Spectre, Aquaman, and probably best known for his stuff on Brave and Bold. But, but I just love the guy's artwork. But that's, uh, that's a pretty cool cover. Okay, Space Adventures number 10, more Ditko. I really didn't know that Charlton had the uh, many sci-fi books as they did until I started doing a little bit of research. Uh, another copy of number 10. And uh, most of the stuff I got for like 99 cents. Maybe up to a couple bucks on most of it. Uh, Space Adventures number 13. I think it's a Pat Boyette cover. Number 9. More Ditko, Captain Adam. Number 11. More of the same. Number 12. Another number 9. And I found a really cool uh, Silver Age. Uh, unusual Tales, I'm not sure. I think it's number 31. Uh, really, really nice Steve Bidco cover. Now you get back into this stuff uh, where a lot of it's just the original art by Ditko, and they're going to be a little bit more pricey. I got a pretty good deal on this one, but uh, a lot of the stuff where he started out with Charlton is, is uh, kind of up there. 
money wise. And for you fans of Gorgo and Conga, here's a May issue of Gorgo. I think Hippie uh, collects either Gorgo or Conga or both, I'm not sure. Uh, there's Conga, November issue. Kind of beat up, but can't beat it for the price. September issue, Conga. And Mysteries of Unexplored Worlds. Not sure about the number. Classic sci fi cover. Like I say, one of the big names came from uh, Charlton was. Uh, John Byrne. Here I find a pretty high grade copy of Doomsday Plus One. Got your classic Planet of the Apes Commandy type cover. <laughs> I wonder how many times this kind of thing was swiped. Good series though. And we'll get to the horror stuff. Okay. Monster Hunters number 13 with Ditko cover. Like I said, a lot of the stories, uh, it's not great literature, uh, but they're fun reads, and uh, a lot of the artwork in them is just top notch. Okay, here we have Strange Suspense Stories. Not sure about the number, but. Okay, then he goes to Dr. Gray's number 27. Tales, not sure the number. Goes to Dr. Graves, number 38. More Ditko. Monster Hunters, number 14. Yeah, 14. This is actually a Mike Zeck cover, uh, another really talented artist that came from the Charlton stable. You can see his name on the side. Monster Hunters number 10. I'm not sure this might be a Tom Sutton cover. Uh, his are uh, his are my favorites, the covers and stories that he does. And Monster Hunters number two. I'm pretty sure that's Tom Sutton. Painted cover. Seventeen. Number sixteen. Get the harpoons. Then goes to Dr. Graves. That's number twenty. Hunters number 12. High grade number one with a Tom Sutton painted cover. Uh, Beyond the Grave number one. Sorry about the glare. I already stuck this one in Mylar, so. But that cover is really cool. Goes to Dr. Graves, number 21. Number 
23. Not sure who did the cover on this one, but Scary Tales number 24. Number 26. Guy looks like he's got indigestion. And Doomsday Plus One, number 12. This was actually the last issue. Ghost Manor, number 20. I actually think there were two different series of Ghost Manor, so that might have been the second series. I think this is from the first series. Uh, Ghost Manor number two. Uh, Scary Tales number one. It's actually a Joe Staten painted cover, another name uh, that went on to do stuff for DC and Marvel. Yeah, I think this is the uh, second series of Ghost Matter. Uh, this is number one. Okay, Monster Hunter's number one. That's a really nice Tom Sutton painted cover. Last one we got, I think it's uh, it's just a duplicate of the early one I showed, Ghost of Dr. Graves 27. So that's all I got for right now, guys. Uh, I appreciate you hanging with me. Uh, I hope uh, you Charlton collectors have enjoyed this, and uh, it'll make you want to get more. I got uh, probably a couple more uh, packages coming in with some Charlton stuff. So uh, next week, hopefully, I'll be able to do another one. Uh, in the meantime. I appreciate the comments, guys. It's uh, glad to be back in the mix. And uh, as always, onward and upward.